All right, um, I want to give it to uh, Tony to sort of discuss deep scope hierarchies in order for you to sort of get a nice bridge into the architecture itself. Cool, uh, yeah, so like Thomas said, my name's Tony. I also work on the mobile platform team. Uh, I happen to work on Android, but all of the stuff tonight is pretty platform agnostic. So um, should be pretty generic. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about scoping, but before I go into what that is and, and why it's important, uh, I kind of wanted to highlight that, you know, the, the next two talks are more kind of in the weeds, nuts and bolts. Um, the scoping talk is a bit more conceptual, but it kind of uh, drove a lot of the decisions we made for, for trade-offs and, and uh, kind of why we designed it the way we designed it. Um, so before I go into what scoping actually means and, and why it's important to us, I wanted to take a step back and talk about some of the engineering challenges we were facing with the previous app. Um, and a lot of those deal with state. So if you ever worked in a, a mobile app before, it's pretty common that you have to deal with uh, asynchronous state. And it's also pretty common that you can kind of get into issues that are, are tricky to debug or, or figure out. Um, maybe you work on like a, a mobile photo uploading app. Maybe you could like upload a photo asynchronously um, and like the user can sign out what should happen there, right? Like it's sometimes there are issues like product features that you just don't know about until like the user runs into them. Um, and at Uber, this is particularly tricky. So um, we have lots of asynchronous state. You know, you can request a trip. Uh, maybe a driver accepts, then cancels. Maybe you're in an Uber pool trip and you get another rider. So there's kind of lots of asynchronous things happening at all sorts of times in the app. Um, and the app has to handle them correctly. And then on top of that, there's 150 plus contributors on each platform. So um, it's kind of unrealistic to assume that, you know, everyone writing code on these rep rep ah, repositories, um, you know, understands how the entire app works. Uh, if, if we were to say that we're, we could only build a reliable app if everyone contributing code understands every single part of it, uh, it would be impossible. Um, so those are some of the, uh, the state issues that we dealt with in the previous app. So scopes. Uh, what are scopes and why are they important? So for the, the sake of this talk, I guess the scope of this talk, uh, <laughs> um, I'll define a scope as kind of the life cycle in which an object exists. Um, maybe some examples of that might be like, we have a logged in scope. So if there's an object with a logged in scope, maybe it's created when you log in and it's garbage collected or deallocated when you log out. Uh, or maybe we have a map scope. So objects that exist at the map scope, they would be you know, created with a map and then torn down when the map is torn down. Uh, and if this still sounds pretty conceptual, uh, I think if anyone who has kind of worked in a mobile app has probably worked with the biggest scope, the app scope. So uh, if you've worked in a mobile app, chances are you've probably, you know, added some kind of app singleton. Uh, so in iOS, you know, you can have app singletons on like the UI application delegate. On Android, uh, it's pretty common to have uh, app singletons on the Android application object. And oftentimes when you, you know, make lots of app singletons, uh, people say they're bad. And there's usually kind of two common, uh, two common reasons why people don't like app singletons. Uh, the first is testing. So they're, depending on how you um, define app singletons, sometimes people use things like you know, static methods, like these uh, shared instance methods. Um, those are pretty hard to test. I'm not gonna talk about testing too much tonight. It's, it's kind of out of scope for this, no pun intended. Uh, but the other big downside with, uh, with app level uh, singletons is kind of global state. So if you have lots of objects that exist for the entire duration of an application, that means you know, they exist for all the state of the application and they kind of have to you know, deal with all of that state. So arguably, if you have lots of app scope objects, it means you have lots of stateful, fragile objects. Um, and stateful objects are kind of bad at Uber because you know, the more stateful bugs we have, the harder they are to kind of track down. Something like a crash is very easy to triage and kind of uh, tackle quickly, but uh, state bugs, you know, they, they leave the app in a, a weird state where you know, it might be stuck or it might not look correct. Um, and they, they don't come in as a crash report. They usually come in through you know, end users saying they're stuck, uh, dog fooders saying there's something wrong. And these kinds of things are, are much slower to, to figure out. So the less of these kinds of issues we have, the better. So this is kind of a, a uh, fake dummy version of the app scope in the previous rider app, uh, and I'll go through it. So we have kind of three, uh, three example fake classes, and, and we can assume there's a lot more stuff here. So maybe 
we have like a, a pickup request manager. So maybe this class is responsible for gathering details about your pickup, maybe what product you're using, where you're going, that kind of stuff. Uh, there's also a destination refinement stream. So this might be used if you're in like a big apartment complex or a big building and we don't know how to pick you up because you're, you know, we, there's many entrances and we ask you to kind of pick a, a more relevant entrance. Uh, and the last example here is a driver location map layer. So maybe this is just like a UI component that shows the, um, the driver on the map and a lot more stuff. So in reality, the, the Uber apps, or the, the previous Uber app had a lot of stuff at AppScope. Uh, and it's worth highlighting for these three examples, none of these things have to be at AppScope. Uh, the pickup request manager, that only is useful when you're doing a pickup. The destination refinement stream, that's only useful if you have to refine your destination. And then the driver location map layer, well, if you don't have a driver, then it's not super useful. Um, so what's so bad about this? Uh, I guess you know, these objects don't have to exist, but, but is it really that bad? Uh, there's this global state problem, but it's kind of, you know, very nebulous. Uh, and it's also convenient to put stuff in the app scope. So it's like the easiest place to put stuff. Um, so if it's really easy, why should we try to avoid having all of these app singletons? So the first big thing I want to highlight is kind of the stability and code quality uh, impacts. So if you have an object that lives longer than necessary, you, you kind of expose it to a lot of stuff that it doesn't need to be exposed to. So uh, this is kind of uh, an apologies. Uh, I tried to make a like platform agnostic language, so it's like Java, but there's Swift optionals. It's kind of weird. Um, but on the right, you'll see there's this there's this driver is on their way toaster class, and it's supposed to be responsible for for showing like a toast or an alert when the driver is is kind of on their way. So maybe it would say like, hey, you know, Tony is your driver. Um, but in this example, it's app scope, so it has to exist, you know, as long as the app does. So it ends up being much more stateful than it has to. So you'll see that it, you know, it has to take this trip state stream as a dependency, has to like wait until you're on trip. Once you're on trip, it'll show the toast. Then it has to remember that it like already showed the toast. And then when you go back off trip, it has to kind of like reset itself. Uh, so it's pretty complicated and it's pretty fragile too. So um, you know, this has to be maintained and tested. Uh, for example, if someone added another state, this might break. Um, if there's lots of classes like this, Chances are, you know, some of them would break and the person who changed it might not notice. So um, by having things at AppScope, you kind of expose them to a lot more state than, than would be ideal. Uh, the next downside I wanted to highlight, which is a, a bit more subtle, is that uh, input and dependency contracts are a bit diluted. So if you have lots of things at AppScope, you can't have super rigid dependencies that kind of express what the class is trying to do or what it really needs. Um, so in this example, there's this authenticated network requester uh, class. And uh, we could assume that all, it's kind of an empty implementation, but we can assume that uh, maybe it's like responsible for adding an authentication token as a header or something like that. And uh, you'll see this uh, auth token optional. Um, it doesn't, it really shouldn't be optional. So it takes in an optional auth token, but the implementation really needs a, a non-null auth token. So it's kind of weird. It's like, why, why does it have to be optional? Well, the reason it takes an optional auth token is because that's all that's available at AppScope. Um, even if we were to move that optional outside of this class, somewhere you have to do this you know, gross potential NLD reference. Uh, and it's just really unclear. Uh, so if I was to write a test for this, you know, like what, do I test it? If it do I test it with a, a null auth token? Do I test it with non-null? It's kind of unclear what, what the valid dependency is. So if, if you were to have better scoping here, you can say you need a non-null auth token, and it would be much more clear that this class should only exist when you have an auth token. Uh, and there's a few other smaller issues. So uh, one thing is kind of a, a performance or efficiency cost. If you have lots of objects at the app scope, you know, they live as long as the app does. So it's not super efficient. Uh, in Uber's case, most of the objects were kind of these um, you know, simple like data holder-y, state holder type objects that aren't very expensive, but it's still, you know, it's, it's a non-zero impact, and especially uh, on Android and like emerging markets, we kind of want to get all the memory we can get. Um, the other interesting thing, which is a bit more, uh, I don't know, it's a bit subjective, but I would argue classes can grow to not have a clear purpose. So if you look back at that toaster class, I can kind of see how a year from now it would turn to this just like generic, like all serving, all pur like general purpose toaster class that's like a thousand lines and like really fragile and has no owner. Um, so in general, I would, I would argue that by having lots of app scope stuff, you just end up with much bigger classes that are 
kind of hard to maintain. And uh, I guess somewhat unrelated to AppScope, but um, you know, the, the real Uber app wasn't as bad as some of these examples, but there was no easy way to kind of define custom scopes. So you were almost incentivized to put things in the app scope. You could define your own scopes, but you were kind of on your own to figure out how to do that and you know, what the best practices were. Um, yeah, so this is what the previous app looked like. So it wasn't all app scoped, but you'll see that all of the scopes we had were kind of defined by screens. Uh, so in this example, there's a sign up screen scope, a logged in scope, and then you know, some other screens had scoped scopes. Um, but features couldn't define their own scopes. So you'll see there's this commute feature, there's this airport feature, this pricing feature, and they were kind of all you know, jammed up in the logged in scope and they couldn't you know, define their own scopes, define their own requirements. So it's a little bit um, you know, like we have scopes, but if everything is in the logged in scope, well then the, the global state argument is pretty much the same. You know, it's not in the app scope, but there's still a bunch of global state. So how do we want to improve this with the new architecture? So uh, it was pretty clear that a lot of our you know, non-obvious crashes were, were state related. So if we had some kind of pattern or framework to, to reduce the amount of state most classes were exposed to, then in theory, we would have a, a you know, slightly more stable app. The other interesting thing is that the view hierarchy doesn't really line up with, um, with business logic. So let's say we had scopes based on views. I think the map is a great example. So in the Uber app, um, you know, you open the app, you're not on a trip, there's a map, uh, you request a car, you know, the, the car, you see the car on the map, it's still the same map, you go on the trip, still the same map, and then you finish the trip and you go, you know, off trip, and you still have the same map. So if we were to define scopes based on views, um, the scopes would live just as long as the app did, more or less, and it wouldn't be super useful. Instead, we wanted to define scopes based on business logic. So having something like, you know, I'm in a requesting state scope, or I'm in an on-trip state scope. Uh, this would be much more useful for us because we can kind of narrow down the state objects have to exist within. Uh, and last is we want to make it really easy to define your own scopes. So ideally, if we do this right, feature teams can easily define scopes based on business logic, and it's very clear and consistent. So it's kind of a thing that you know, you're encouraged to do, and it's not very tedious. So just to summarize, we wanted scopes based on business logic. Um, and going back to kind of that, that app delegate that I showed before, um, what if we took some of those dependencies and, and reapply them with business logic -y scopes? So we'll start off with, with scopes, and we have this root scope, and it's not much better than the app scope because it's pretty much the same thing. It doesn't, doesn't know anything. It can't make any assumptions. Um, more or less all of the downsides of you know, the app scope with global state, they still apply here. But when the user logs in, maybe we'll create a logged in scope. And this is where it gets a bit more interesting. So uh, here, you can assume that you have a non-null auth token, and any dependencies created here can kind of leverage that and assume it's not null. So if we go back to the example of the uh, authentication, or sorry, authenticated network requester, uh, here's the old implementation. It had this kind of confusing optional auth token dependency, and then it you know, potentially NPE'd when it dereferenced it. Uh, the new implementation would be like this. It's very subtle, right? So we, it's not optional. Um, but it's much more clear. It's very clear that this class needs a non-null auth token, and it's very clear that it's much more safe. And also worth noting is if anything needs this class, um, it has to be in the logged in scope to get it. So previously, uh, you can kind of request this class when you're in any part of the app and it might not work. You might be signed out and this might crash before because it was, you know, it was optional. And if it was null, it would crash. Now, if you can get it thanks to the compiler, it's, it's much safer. You know that you have an auth token. Uh, you know that you can safely use it. So let's add another scope. Um, so that was logged in. What if we're logged in on trip? So now we have you know, all the assumptions of the logged in scope. We can assume there's a non-null authentication token. And because we know the app is on trip, we can also assume a bunch of the trip dependencies are available. So features that exist in this scope can leverage all of that too. So going back to this crazy toaster example, um, before the class was way, like very stateful, had to subscribe to all the trip states, had to reset itself, um, pretty fragile. But if it existed in the on-trip state, it would be much simpler. So it's, you know, it doesn't have to subscribe to that. So all it does is show a toast. Um, and I think this is, you know, it's, it's kind of a silly example because we probably wouldn't make a class to show a toast. But I think it's kind of a, a good example of how you can leverage these business logic scopes to kind of reduce the state you're exposed to and not have to worry about it. So um, 
the, the scoping, like ribs, which you'll talk about next, that'll handle the, the states, that'll handle attaching the right scopes to the right time. In this class, doesn't have to worry about any of that. It just, you know, it's very clear that all it's supposed to do is show a toast. So it's much more maintainable, much more clear, much more testable. And lastly, I just wanted to kind of talk about what the actual scope tree looks like. So this is a uh, representation of the new app. It's, it's quite a bit uh, simplified. There's lots of scopes and it wouldn't really fit in the screen. But you'll see that they're not really screen-based. So before the previous scopes, they were all you know, logged in screen, signed out screen. But now each feature or business state in the app can have its own scope. Um, and it's much easier too. So I like to highlight that like favorites and location editor. These are kind of you know, feature, more feature-y uh, type things that kind of define their own scopes. So it's much more easier and it's much more consistent for teams to define scopes and kind of leverage them for safety and stability and clarity. So that's pretty much it for scopes. Uh, Actually, also worth noting is Brian has a great blog post uh, on the Edge blog, if you want to read that, because it also talks about scopes. Um, but next, he's going to talk about kind of the implementation details of this, since it was pretty uh, conceptual.